Welcome to Money Matters TV. I'm your host, Patty Tuadros. My co-host today is Paul Mitchell, and we have a great show for you today, including an Indonesian indie fashion designer you don't want to miss. It's good to Hi, see you, Paul. Good to see you, Patty. Yeah. So uh, you're a social media expert, and uh, social media has been a lot in the news recently. Oh my gosh, it really has. Uh, a lot of negative stuff in particular. And uh, it's such a big thing now. I mean, uh, I keep thinking, and I'm sure our viewers would be interested, how do you deal with all this? How do you uh, make sure that you don't get caught in social media? Or if it does happen, how do you take care of it? Or all yeah. this stuff. You know what I tell clients who don't want to be involved in social media at all? Oh, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to have a Facebook page or mm -hmm. Instagram profile. I said, it doesn't matter if you don't want to do it. Your client, your customers, clients, whoever, they have it and they're talking about you already. So you need to get into the conversation so that you can try and direct it, the direction it needs to go, mm -hmm. answer some, questions. Or somebody has a cell phone with video on. Oh, that's dangerous. Everyone and, has that and now. you do something by accident, you're in the wrong place, or you uh, act a little poorly for whatever reason, that type of thing, the next thing you know, it goes viral. Yeah, it does. There were a couple of those recently here mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's nasty stuff and all. Yeah. So th despite all the positive things about social media, th there seems to be enough negative ones, too, that you really have to be careful. Yeah, you know, people say cameras are everywhere, mm -hmm. and everybody's wa somebody's watching you at all times. You really you can't do anything dumb anymore. Yeah. Well, I, I always thought that uh, if you travel, I mean, two things. One, uh, you shouldn't be taking pictures of other people without their express permission, whether it's a little kid or the, the, the man or the woman standing around or something. That's invasion of privacy. And number two, that uh, you know, if somebody if somebody video videos you, they're invading your privacy. That's supposed to be, I thought, illegal or unethical or on something or other. But now it just seems to be just the way it is. You know, it's interesting. I have clients when they do photo shoots, they get releases, and if they go into a public place I mean. and there's people at tables, they make them sign a release, yeah. or they blur their face out. You see that mm -hmm. on TV where they blur someone's face out. But at the same time, if they're not making money, maybe they can do it. Like when you watch the news people are on there that haven't agreed to, especially embarrassing clips where they talk about, you know, people being overweight and then they show women from the waist down and men from the waist down or big bellies or wow. really, you know, embarrassing photos. Mm -hmm. Those people didn't sign on for that. Yeah. Or demonstrators, whether it's, uh, you know, March in Washington or something or something at a local, at a, at a, at a, in a city or something like that. So you're, you're everywhere and your, your picture can be everywhere in, in social media. And it can change your life overnight. Mm -hmm. Definitely for the positive for some people, but mostly for the negative. Yeah. yeah. So, h what do people do then? How, what what, is, what should they do? Is there is there a way to get rid of it? Does it? It depends. You can't really get rid of it. If you posted it yourself, you can at least try and do the damage control of removing it. Mm -hmm. But people have screenshotted it. They put it on forums like Reddit. They've posted it to their own page. It's made it to news sites like Mashable, and yeah. suddenly it's all over the world. And it doesn't ever disappear. No, it's there it doesn't. Somewhere. I know the big national one with Kathy Griffin, she deleted all those yeah. images, but Too late. you can watch yeah. that all day long if you want to. Mm -hmm. You can't get, you can't rid of embarrassing stuff. I think the best way to handle it, in my opinion, not as a professional so social media person, but that you just need to go forward and apologize and say that you acted like a fool, mm -hmm. you were drinking too much, you're embarrassed, mm -hmm. or you did something that was in poor taste, yeah. and in retrospect, I can yeah. see that. You're just a human being, and uh, humans are, 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 are frail yeah. and make mistakes. And, and for some things, it's gone in two or three news cycles, and some things, by the time those news cycles have passed, you've also lost your job, yeah, yeah. which I know that happened to a couple of those people that sure. were on the news recently. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and just be careful if you're you're in public, out, out there, you know, outside your the your four walls of your castle. There was a photographer in Philadelphia. I think they were sort of more amateur photographer, and they had a photo exhibit, and they did photos of people eating at outside cafes in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and they weren't lovely photos of people staged looking nice. Mm -hmm. They were photos of people jamming giant sandwiches in their faces. Mm -hmm. I would be so upset if I walked into a gallery yeah. and saw myself like that. Well, it reminds me of when the, the, uh, they pan the, uh, the crowd in a, like a uh, baseball game or, yeah. or a football game. and <laughs> Somebody's doing something <laughs> <Yeah>. dumb. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> One time I was on the Kiss Cam on the Phillies. Oh, really? Yeah. Congratulations, yeah. I guess. <laughs> That'll be there forever. <laughs> yeah, I have never seen it uh, in real life. Uh -huh. You know, once it was on TV, I never saw the clip. But huh. yeah, that stuff just sticks around; it follows you around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you have to be careful. We do have a great, great guest. Uh, I know we're this, gonna this like this jump ahead to. Yeah, I think we should uh, devote uh, as much time as possible. All right. Well, let's start with a viewer question. Sure. All right. So this is from Lena G in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. How can I avoid the little and not so little bank charges? Oh boy, yeah. Well, I'm a I'm a longtime commercial banker. I've been commercial banking since well, since the '70s, and um, you know even the charges back then <laughs> weren't weren't so little. And uh, I was a branch manager, and we would get uh, our monthly financial report, and one of the big income generators was those overdraft fees. So 30 years ago, overdraft fees could still be twenty-seven dollars. Per check, and you know we could re refund them, especially people maybe they're innocently you know, they forgot to do something and they got five five of those charges you know within two days, they refund some of them, but you know have them but still stick, which is still still a lot of money. So uh, there, I understand uh, the, the consequences of uh, of those charges at all. The main there are two main things in dealing with the, all these different charges. One is unfortunately reading the fine print. Asking you know very detailed questions uh, with your banker when you open up an account, or even periodically, um, these things change you know uh, frequently, and uh, generally the charges are you know are going to go up. But I would um, you know make it a point, maybe send an email to the customer service people someplace that will give you a detailed answer. You know what what the charges will, will be, what's the status of your current account. Um, you know people open accounts, it's a it's a free account. You know the charges are going to be minimal, that type of thing. They think forever. And then maybe the bank gets bought by some, some other bank, and now it's not the same old bank, and all those, those types of things. Um, asking a lot of questions. Yeah, reading the fine print, I'm sorry. Uh, you're responsible for that. Um, of course, the other thing is understanding what the, the, these, the general rules are, the big fees, the main fees you might run into uh, up front. Different banks have different policies, especially whether it's a you know, free checking account, whether you maintain a minimum, uh, with no minimum balance required. Now, there are banks that, that do that, generally uh, local community banks. You can check around. Um, larger banks are generally aren't, aren't quite as liberal with that, though sometimes they have a senior account. Check it out. Nothing, nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm a senior. Here's my, here's my driver's license. Uh, you know, I'd like to take advantage of this, this deal. Um, so what kind of charges might, might you run into? Um, Minimum balance requirement. It's free checking. You just have to maintain a thousand dollars on average, ten thousand dollars on average. You have to have your your paycheck or some other kind of uh, check um, uh, automatically deposited um, every, every month. It gets pretty complicated. Um, so ask the, ask the questions of the, of the banker. You got to read the fine print. Um, it's probably not not going to go go away. But uh, you know, check around. Just like any kind of business, you know, they vary from from time to time. Uh, they may all look the same. But if you, if you really get underneath the covers and stuff, you can see some, some differences and, and find out which is the best bank for you. But it's a good question. We all have to deal with it. Thanks. I think a, a good point is if people do accidentally make a mistake and they get an overdraft. Or any kind of charge. To call and ask for a, if a they would give it back to you. Uh, an explanation. I, yeah. I personally had a situation where um, I d did a stop payment. I was concerned about this check coming through or whatever, trying to stop a uh, previously you know, like monthly charge in my account. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I stopped the payment, it was going to be thirty dollars. If I let it go and overdrew my account, it's going to be you know thirty-five dollars. And um, the person at the branch said, "We'll take care of it. It's okay." So ask that's the other be best advice. Personal it, touch. Yeah, and yeah. you know once or twice, but if it becomes a pattern, and they have ways of checking how many times that happens. So, but once or twice, yeah. Okay, great. And if you have questions and you want to send them into Money Matters, here's how to do it. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. 
Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, TV dot com. So our upcoming guest, her name is Matrini Sumatu Pang, which I am sure that I destroyed her name <laughs> in some way. But she is an indie fashion designer, and we are lucky enough to see a clip of her showing at New York Fashion Week. So take a look. Super impressive. Thank so you. nice to meet you, Matrini. Thank you. Thank you for having me as your guest for The Money Matters. Yeah. So how did you get into this business? Um, well, it's not easy. I used to live in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and I took um, fashion studies at Moore College, mm -hmm. Art and Design. And you know, in the classes, we do the mood board, kind of those stuff, you know, how to know about the, the fashion. So then I come up with, you know, creating the one of collections and I've been thinking about, you know, a cocktail dresses or special events. So then I come up with the theme of Meet the Millennials. So mm. and then it started, you know, with the younger generations, you know, I kind of like learning from the baby boomers and then, then we kind of like having a buzzwords about Meet the Millennials. So I guess mm. well, let's try to do this. So then, you know, then from there I started, you know, to to learn more about um you know, the style in the American way, but also how to bring my own heritage, like I'm from Indonesia, and how to mix them together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that what you're wearing now, one of your own designs? Yeah, this is the, we call it name is an ulos, which is a from not Sumatra, from Batak uh, tribe. So if you ha ever drink coffee from Sumatra, mm -hmm. so then you met with the person, the native person, and these are the, the cloth that we usually as a tapestry, but now I'm thinking how to bring the the pattern and also the characters of the the, the fabrics into a wearable. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful. Thank you. What, what is your background there? The the drums and all. What's, what's so all this that? is a drum we call is a gondang, and usually um, in our traditions we used to have a um, a music performance, um, such as in the wedding or funerals, and also if somebody have a celebration of harvesting. Um, you know, we kind of like a from agriculture in a way. Mm -hmm. So then people we get together and then having the musical percussion most likely mm -hmm. and having the drum get along with some of the flute and also another ensemble. So this is a um, very art artistic, I mean like it's original. It, it, it has been shipped coming to the, you know, mm -hmm. to the United States and yeah. this is the community Belong we call it the Parsadon Bangsa Batak, which is like the community of Bataknis in Washington DC yes. area. See, okay, see the, the name yeah. there. Yes. So uh, yeah, somebody doesn't walk into a music shop in in uh, in Sumatra and, and buy this. Yeah, they can. Then then they need to do the shipping because okay. it's a big <laughs> one, right? <laughs> like if you you heard about Javanese music ensemble from Gamelan and then each of the other tribe, and this is from Bataknis, and you know the kind of similar mm. concept. Yeah. So how did you get to show in New York Fashion Week? That's a very prestigious, <laughs> very prestigious <laughs> opportunity. Yeah, first of all, um, I got opportunity to attend the, um, um, they call it a pageant show, hmm. which is they call as a Miss Grand International. 
So then there is one of the, um, the Miss from the Luxembourg would like to highlight my dresses. So then, you know, I came there and in Las Vegas, it was um, last year and um, you know showing case and from there you know networking and then they introduced me you know to go to the new fashion week to to show my products well, how many other fashion people were at las vegas hundreds a lot yeah i mean how yeah. did you, you get picked i mean that's, that's quite an accomplishment yeah we're <laughs> super impressed <laughs> <laughs> i guess what i'm trying to bring um for some reason they would like to see like independent designer that based on in U.S. since the Miss Grand International um, hosted in Las Vegas for the first time, mm -hmm. they used to be in other Asian countries such mm -hmm. as in Thailand, but now you know um, they are doing in in Vegas, and they would like to find you know um, the independent designer from United States, not like a big name because yeah. I'm still a newbie here. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, how many years have you been? In the I business? started in the business. Um, by yeah. by law, it's like 2014. You know, register. You know, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. I, I put in under the name of uh, Batak Bule Enterprises. Mm -hmm. I carry the label name is Bataks. Yeah, you you show your previous um, talking conversations about social media, mm -hmm. and then we yes. try to get into the social media. You know, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, you know, e-commerce for yeah. the the website. Yeah. So what do, what does Bataks mean? Or Batak is the name of my tribe. Okay. Yeah, okay. and then I kind of like make a X at the end. It's sort of like a futuristic in a way. <laughs> I like and that. Yeah, and then you know, like right now, what I learned from the U.S. in terms of business, you need to have like a catchy name. Yes. And then make it like as short possible, and it has as simple possible, but then it has a, a meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. So then I've been thinking, then I come up with the name of Batak as my tribe name. Yes. But then I change a uh, spelling B M B A T A X. So Batak is my private label. So when you got invited to New York Fashion Week, did you already have an entire collection ready? Yeah, um, I had like, a, well, when you go to the runway, there is requirements for the at, at least showing 20 until 25 uh, pieces of garments. So, you know, from the collections I get into, yeah, when I was in the school, I started with the year like 10 of them, mm -hmm. and I did the fashion um, show at the old district here, old city, and then they highlight a couple of my dresses, but I was like, you know, not so sure, you know, whether it, it you know, it come up with the taste in, in, in Northeast, mm -hmm. because my color is very bright, you know, like colorful, mm -hmm. maybe because it's coming from where I came from, like tropical country from Indonesia. So then after that, I adding more another 10, so I have a, you know, like a, a modern uh, for the cocktail dresses and special occasion, and then I add more on the ethnic fabrics from Indonesia, such as from my tribe, Ulos, like I'm wearing right now. Mm -hmm. And also there's batik, which is from Javanese. Yes. It becomes uh, famous and popular of the yeah, UNESCO at the World Heritage. Mm -hmm. And then I add more from Bali, they call it Rang Rang. So these are the, the fabrics that usually came with the ceremony or tradition, but I bring to the different level into the, the dresses. So you're actually importing the fabric from Indonesia? The original one, I got it from Indonesia, but I get the, the mixed fabrics, you know, like the solid color mm -hmm. is from the U.S. And I tried to make a business model of made in USA, you yeah. know, doing manufacturing sure, here. Sure. But at the same time, you know, honoring where the fabrics heritage coming from. Mm -hmm. Because most of them like hand looming yes. and also like waxing dyeing system with the, the batik. So kind of like bringing the originality. And it's not easy because, you know, there's the price point too that we cannot compete with the mass production from sure, China, sure. you know. So try to bring it back to made in the United States or made in America at the same time, you know, bring the culture and identity. So if I want to buy a dress now, what would I do? Not you for you, right? Not, not for me. <laughs> hey, <laughs> no, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you ca we can do direct from our website, and also we do some retail boutique in um, uh, uh, such as a Kawa. Right now we're doing in DC, and um, you know, previous year when I, you know, I live in Philadelphia, I have a co-op here in Old City, mm -hmm. and also some in the Walnut Street. So they kind of a um, uh, co-op independent designer uh, space. And yeah, hopefully, you know, when I, you know, pretty sure about the boutique is settled, then eventually I'm gonna have like boutique here in either in DC or in New York. Yeah. But you know, it's a tough business when we do have brick and mortar system. So I'm kind of trying to find out a, a different kind of business model. 
So your demographic, is it millennial? Yes, it's at the age of um, 18 until 28, and in the second batch it's like 29 until 39, mm -hmm. because I do have a, um, you know, like a very formal but not formal in a way, like a shorter for the cocktail dresses, mm -hmm. which is like more than like junior type thing. And then there's like evening wear, which is like a longer one, which is more likely like people that have been in the job and the offices, you know, they have like, you know, special event, like mm -hmm. whining or dining, you know, garden party. It's kind of like more spring and summer collections in a way. But I think in the fall or, um, you know, during winter, people can get their coat, I guess, and still warmer because there's a lot of heater in the restaurant, I mean, in a party. Yeah. <laughs> so. So why DC? You mentioned DC a couple times. S um, right now, I live in DC and um, I expand a different market because DC is sort of like close to Maryland area and mm -hmm. also Virginia. So I kind of like try to, to get more international exposure because a lot of embassy there, international mm -hmm. organizations, people need, you know, there's a lot of partying, you know, like formal or informal, you all know, all politics. The, all, all the lobbyists. All the lobbyists, there. right, mm -hmm. yeah. So I kind of like try to different markets before, you know, before I move to West Coast. That makes sense. Way. Yeah. So you were also in fashion show in DC, right? Yes, in DC Fashion Week that, um, they highlight me as emerging emerging designer. So, well, were you happy about that? You don't. No, I. It's kind of a new cutting edge term, you know, like um, why we call this emerging. I guess it makes sense because um, there is not like it's not like fully couture. That's how the traditional of the fashion world. But then they're like bringing something new taste in the market. So they call this like uh, emerging designer. For that, yeah. And you brought a clip for that, right? Yes, I got the clips, and I hope um, the audience can see and enjoy the clips. Yeah. Great. Why don't we play that? Maybe you can tell us about the dresses that come out. Sure. So um, the dresses that um, I'm doing, like this one, is more likely for the garden party. It has a um, it's a modern style, but in Indonesia, usually we, we cannot do like a sleeveless like this, but I would like to have in, Indone um, in American market, they would like to see, you know, the body and also how, you know, how brave you are in confidence with the dresses. And this is more like, um, I call this a jasmine dress. I, I call, I, I name my dresses. And then um, the other clips, it's, um, it's in a pink, because it's more likely, when people, it's a very big thing here in the U.S. about the Valentine's, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I like pink. I wear pink, pink myself. And I just like give an idea. Okay, give it a pink and it's easier for for the uh, the millennials to pick it. And having like a flowery, at, you know, for the skirt. And it has pocket too on the side. Yeah. Was it hard for you to make the differentiation coming from design, how you grew up designing for Indonesian women and now being able to show all the skin? So, um, like you have a cutaway in that dress. Yes, yeah, a cutaway. This is like a, um, um, like I call it a uh, senorita, like a Spanish. It's a, you know, it kind of like try to fit in the body, but you still look elegant in a way. It's not like so crazy open, but then you can like see a simple and elegant confidence and mm -hmm. classy in a way. So in Indonesia, usually, you know, we need to cover our shoulder, you know, not mm -hmm. really open, kind of those Short things. sleeves? Yeah, yeah, short sleeve. At least you know having yeah. you know cover your shoulder a little bit. But here, this is a Shanghai. You know, I it got inspirations from China for the color. You know, the That's color neat. at the neck. Yeah, yeah. and then I put like a, a tulip skirt style, and I play with the ribbon. I know like when people like doing sewing, it's not easy because it requires certain skills to sew that. And I again is doing it for the pink because I'm thinking about you know Valentine's for February. No, I know models are always skinny and all, but do you offer yes, things for that's people a good that question. are more full figured? Right. Um, actually, for my case, um, that's a good question because a lot of people, uh, big is beauty, that's for me. And then they will like, you know, big, big and beauty, and they will like to look cute in a way. Mm -hmm. So I use the, uh, the size is um, zero until 12. Mm -hmm. So then if it is more than that, you know, we kind of have had like a, custom 
custom yeah. sizing. That's nice that you offer that. Right. So it's not easy because I start from scratch. I start from my sketches. I draw it and start from my mood board and then um, doing some draping from the dress form mm -hmm. and translate it into the pattern making. So I do my own pattern. It's not like try to copy like the commercial one. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of works, but I'm so happy about, you know, how it looks with people. What do what, what you think about your experience at the Moore College of Art? Moore, it's an old school way. You know, when I was there, they did not show us how to do with the, um, you know, they're not really strongly recommend us to do like a, a computer stuff. They show us how, how really? they did it from very old time. You know, like you do the, the, the draping with the body, and then put it into, uh, bring on the table, and then transfer it to the paper, and then fit it again, and then make corrections, right? But I guess um, when I went to the manufacturing, you know, like we have a classes in New York, I usually attend it every year, they said that's the right thing, because the computer usually do the straight line, but our body is never straight line. Mm -hmm. So the more, um, I think the dress is, when the more curve you see, the more likely it's gonna be more expensive, I guess, and then uh, that's what we call it the constructions, and also from the fabric itself. Mm -hmm. So I don't really, I try not to less polyester in a way, because polyester sometimes it's not good on your skin. You feel kind of like itchy or maybe mm -hmm. like um, hot, you know. So then I try to make it like more natural, mm -hmm. you know. but you know, it's always a price, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a favorite dress? So my favorite Especially look dress, at this collection, yeah, amazing. Yeah, this one is Sadum. I call it from other, um, my Ulos, which is the top. It's kind of like, you know, Eva. Eve, it's gorgeous. Know, yeah, so this is the top. And then, you know, the bright color itself, it's uh, green and red. It represents how we came from the mountain. And this one is a dark blue. It's a, um, usually this one is a when, it's kind of a sad thing because usually we carry this Ulos for funeral, mm -hmm. but it means like a blessing to send them to heaven in a way, because majority of us is like um, Christian in a way. So then I kind of call it as like a um, um, ocean diplo. And then this is the red one that I wear. And if you take a look at the cut itself, it, is, it got inspired by a um, Japanese cut and Korean style, because mm -hmm. this is like more loose in a way, but it's kind of like still sassy and then flowing as, you know, as it's walking. And this one, it's a longer dress for the evening wear. The top is the hand looming from not Sumatra, uh, you know, and then I combine with, this is a solid fabric that I, you know, I tried to make it from US. So the top will be from Indonesia, mm -hmm. and then the, the bottom one is gonna be from the US and manufacturing here. And how, and sorry, how often do you have new lines? New lines, um, I try to make it like um, every year, at least I add like five you know, five new, you know, inspirations. Um, when, you know, from I travel somewhere, I just come back from Netherlands, and then, you know, like knowing what's come up next and try to see like, um, you know, like bring the inspirations from the nature and mm -hmm. also how people choose their dresses, the colors and the mm -hmm. style, or maybe the weather, and then bring me into, you know, a, a, another collection. That's great. Yeah. I really enjoyed getting to know you. Thank you. No, well. Paul did as well as my. <laughs> He's writing down some notes about some pink dresses. <laughs> so we're about out of time, but could you spell the name of your website so people can find it? Sure. It's uh, www.batakbule.com, B-A-T-A-K-B-U-L-E.com. And we do have Instagram, Bataksbule, and Facebook, and also tweeting. <laughs> nice. Hopefully yeah. you'll be sharing some from today's interview later. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's some that's of your... Luck. That's the vlog. That's the yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, though. Thank you so much. And we have a guest next week. It's going to be Bruce Mauday, who's the president and media relations and an author. And I hope you'll join us again soon. Thank you so much.